Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay, so now we have reached the last chapter in this entire course and uh, now that you are familiar with all the basic uh, basics of recombinant DNA technology, uh, in this chapter we are going to talk about what are the various applications of genetic engineering and we will be uh, talking mostly about the applications of genetic engineering in medicines and then we'll also briefly discuss what are the various uses uh, for agriculture and environment. And uh, towards the end, we will talk about what are the safety concerns about the use of genetically modified organisms. So before we start talking about uh, the application of uh, recombinant DNA technology in health and disease, uh, I just want to uh, show you these figures which are not really the latest figures but I have taken from a review from 2014 so these are slightly older figures but even six years ago uh, there were about 300 biopharmaceutical products which are made by utilizing the recombinant DNA technology that we have talked about and mostly these uh, are uh, uh, therapeutic proteins and therapeutic antibodies and uh, the sales of these biopharmaceutical products which are made using RDT uh, at that time six years ago uh, was exceeding 100 billion US dollars so uh, this is a huge amount of money uh, and uh, that tells you what is the reach and extent of uh, the use of this recombinant DNA technology and here we are only talking about um, pharmaceutical products we are not talking about other types of uses uh, of uh, recombinant DNA technology for example in agriculture in uh, GM animals and also for many industrial uh, purposes so of this uh, market of 100 billion dollars more than 18 billion dollars uh, are uh, just constituted by the therapeutic monoclonal antibodies and uh, the next category is hormones uh, recombinant hormones uh, they have a market share of 11 billion us dollars and uh, the growth factors uh, have a market share of 10 uh, billion us dollars so uh, that is a really a large a share of uh, the economic activity uh, is constituted by the recombinant DNA products which are used uh, for health and disease purposes and this uh, pie chart gives you a sort of an idea as to what are the various areas uh, in which recombinant therapeutics are being uh, used to treat the human diseases and as you can see uh, more than 50 percent of this share uh, is uh, for meta treatment of metabolic disorders, uh, hematological disorders and for cancer. So uh, a large more than 50 percent share is uh, for products which treat these types of disorders and rest uh, is uh, made up of uh, other infectious diseases, immun immunology, vaccines, etc. Now, uh, early uh, days of recombinant DNA technology when it was put to uh, use for making products for uh, 
the market, then uh, in early times uh, E. coli or non-mammalian cells were utilized to a large extent whereas use of the mammalian cells for making the recombinant DNA product was uh, really uh, not that popular and this was mostly to do with the safety concerns uh, of uh, you know because uh, mammalian and animal cells they can harbor many cryptic viruses and uh, so and also for growth of those cells uh, serum is very often used and in, at that time uh, the serum free media was not uh, very uh, you know uh, popular so uh, there was a lot of safety concerns for use of recombinant DNA products that were made in mammalian cells uh, and this we are talking about uh, early 1990s and uh, but over the years as the techniques have evolved and the safety measures have uh, become more uh, strict and stringent uh, the use of other non-mammalian cells for production of recombinant DNA products has uh, gradually declined and on the other hand the uh, cell, mammalian cell lines for the production of these uh, recombinant therapeutics has uh, gained uh, considerably uh, and uh, they are safe they can be used uh, for therapeutics and this is uh, thanks to a lot of um, processes which have been put in place by various countries uh, to assess the risk factors uh, of the recombinant products. So uh, for the health uh, and uh, disease uh, section of this chapter we will discuss a couple of uh, examples because there are so many therapeutics that are now available in the market uh, that it uh, we cannot talk about all of them so we will start with the first uh, licensed drug that was the recombinant insulin and because uh, insulin uh, that is now used uh, that is marketed is uh, almost entirely recombinant insulin so let's see how this uh, actually uh, developed and how it captured the entire market so in early times before this RDT methods had become commonplace, uh, insulin was actually purified from the pancreas of pigs and cows. So it was an animal product uh, derived from, I, uh, you know, pro it is basically involves purification of the protein from these pancreas of these animals. And uh, uh, then it was marketed for use by human beings and uh, this in today's world this will be unheard of nobody no agency will allow the use of uh, products that are directly derived from the animals uh, because now we understand more about the risks that are involved so by 1970s uh, a large number of uh, human population uh, was suffering uh, with diabetes and they needed insulin and but now in this era there were concerns of how many animals can be supplied for the production of insulin and therefore there was a, a general fear that uh, we will run into shortages of insulin. Uh, another factor was that uh, the animal derived insulin uh, is not identical uh, to human insulin. So there are slight differences although it works, the animal insulin works but because it is slightly different so the efficacy uh, and other uh, things are different from the human insulin. Now it, around this time uh, the recombinant DNA technology was in its nascent stages and uh, the production at the industrial scale was uh, not really uh, a very common practice at that time and so the um, at that time uh, the company which was the biggest producer of insulin was Eli, uh, Eli Nibi and uh, they acquired this recombinant E. coli uh, from a small firm Genentech which was a small biotech startup 
which had uh, gotten on the bandwagon of Recon and DNA technology very early on. And so they had uh, made some recombinant E. coli that could produce human, human insulin. So LLLI, they uh, acquired this uh, E. coli clone from Genentech. And uh, then they uh, basically started marketing this recombinant insulin. So insulin was the first licensed drug which was produced for mass consumption using the recombinant DNA technology. So before we go into how uh, this insulin um, was produced by using recombinant DNA technology, let's first understand a little bit about insulin structure. So uh, we know that uh, insulin, because it's a secretory uh, protein, it is uh, first synthesized and then it enters the endoplasmic reticulum because it has a signal sequence. And so it is synthesized by the pancreatic beta cells as a pre-propeptide. So uh, this pre-propeptide uh, first enters the endoplasmic reticulum where all the membrane and secretory proteins first enter and then uh, and it can enter the ER because it has a signal peptide or a signal sequence. So first that signal peptide is cleaved and then uh, there are a number of disulfide bonds that are formed and these disulfide bonds uh, then allow the um, insulin protein to fold and uh, so if you look at in this cartoon here, there are three regions of insulin uh, that are shown, this blue, the gray, and the green. So you can notice that there is a disulfide bond within this green region of the polypeptide. And then there are these two disulfide bonds, which is between the blue region of the polypeptide and the green region of the polypeptide. So this region which is shown in green uh, gray is the uh, it is known as the connecting peptide and this connecting peptide is then removed so now it leaves uh, the mature insulin where there is a intrachain and interchain disulfide bond so basically now there are two of these polypeptide chains which are linked by disulfide bonds so uh, this connecting peptide is removed in the Golgi and this mature insulin is then packed into secretory vesicles and then uh, secreted. Now as you can see that if the oxidizing environment is not present and the, it is, uh, uh, if this protein is reduced then reduction will basically break these disulfide bonds and the protein can then fall into two separate polypeptide chains. So uh, I'm sorry this figure is somewhat hidden but uh, essentially it shows the same uh, schematic of insulin structure. So the various steps in the maturation of insulin are then the cleavage of the signal sequence and this happens in the endoplasmic reticulum by the signal peptidase which removes the signal peptide. Then the correct formation of the disulfide bonds uh, has to take place for proper folding of insulin. This also takes place into the endoplasmic reticulum and catalyzed by the protein disulfide isomerase. And lastly, the C peptide which is the connecting peptide, it has to be removed and uh, it has to be removed correctly so that there are these two chains of insulin uh, they are uh, they uh, the two chains uh, they uh, held together by the disulfide bonds uh, the final structure of the insulin is produced and this happens in the golgi where there is a pro hormone which is known a uh, convertase and the PC1 and PC2, this PC1 and PC2, they remove this C peptide to yield the final structure of the insulin. So now we can see how uh, the 
for a final formation of insulin molecule involves several steps and these several steps are not taking place in the cytosol they are taking place in two specialized organelles in eukaryotic cells which is the endoplasmic reticulum and golgi and then finally packing packaging into the secretory vesicles so how do you then produce uh, such a complex uh, thing in E. coli. So second uh, category of proteins which again involves the endoplasmic reticulum are, is the recombinant antibodies. Now again antibodies as we know these are secretory proteins and antibodies uh, they have two chains the heavy chain and the light chains. Uh, and again these heavy and light chains they are connected by uh, different numbers of uh, disulfide bonds together. So and uh, uh, recombinant antibodies uh, they are also uh, the fastest growing class of uh, therapeutic recombinant protein products which are out there in the market. And uh, so these uh, antibody molecules, uh, they are also uh, glycosylated in the endoplasmic reticulum and in the Golgi. But uh, because uh, non-glycosylated antibody fragments also exhibit the antigen binding properties through their variable regions, uh, therefore, uh, they are, and of course they are easy to produce because then you don't have to worry about the glycosylation and what type of glycosylation is there on the antibody molecule. Uh, so they are easier to produce. So if you have an antibody fragment which has the biological activity and the biological activity of an antibody is nothing but to that it should be able to bind to the uh, antigen. So if that is still uh, functional, then they, such antibody fragments will be easier to produce than the full length glycosylated antibodies. And many such antibody fragments, they are uh, used as therapeutics because uh, they can be used to bind to their antigen and uh, therefore prevent the disease development. Or they can, uh, these antibody fragments are also used in research for research purposes for affinity purification uh, chromatography. And many uh, such fragments are also used for diagnostic applications. So um, many uh, successful therapeutic antibodies are now available in the market. And uh, some of them are listed here. Most of them are actually uh, anti-cancer antibodies. So uh, a lot of these uh, antibodies, uh, recombinant antibodies, are now used for treatment of various types of cancers and also other diseases. The third major product uh, that is out there in the market is the growth hormone. And growth hormone, as we all know, uh, it stimulates growth and differentiation of the muscles, the bones and the cartilage. So it's very important and uh, many people may be deficient in growth hormone and they may need uh, this growth hormone to prevent stunting. So uh, this uh, growth hormone deficiency is associated with dwarfism and also uh, a re a reduced uh, body mass and overproduction is associated with gigantism, uh, acromegaly and breast tumor growth. So uh, in early uh, 1980s, uh, this uh, human growth hormone was isolated from human cadaver tissue. So again, uh, in present times, uh, no agency is going to approve marketing of this product, which has been isolated from human cadaver. Uh, and because uh, you know uh, it may uh, have other uh, problems this uh, so for example uh, it was found that uh, this human growth hormone that was isolated from human cadavers uh, had it had a very strong association with uh, CFJ disease so mad cow disease so because of that it was banned but you know people who are suffering with these uh, deficiency of growth hormone would need that and that is uh, where the recombinant DNA technology became very useful 
uh, and this is this was quite a challenge because it's a big protein, uh, 22.3 kilodalton, and um, it's a but the good part is that it is non-glycosylated. So and non-glycosylated polypeptide is also active in humans. It is glycosylated, but we common in product even if it is non-glycosylated it is biologically active. It can fulfill its function as a growth hormone and therefore uh, prokaryotic expression systems uh, for the production of growth hormone are, pre are preferred. So um, other than this uh, there is of course factor 8 which is required for uh, blood uh, clot formation. So if people uh, if there is a lot, lot of blood loss due to some problem uh, for example, if people who are bitten by a uh, viper snake, uh, it has a hemolytic toxin, so that does not uh, lead, uh, does not uh, allow the blood to clot, and they such uh, people will need uh, factor eight to uh, prevent the blood loss. So uh, factor eight is again uh, is a very challenging. Uh, product uh, which is now solely made by recombinant DNA technology. So when we are considering the, the production of these eukaryotic secretory proteins, uh, so insulin, antibodies, uh, growth hormone, uh, factor 8, these are all secretory proteins. Uh, so if you want to produce them in E. coli, of course uh, there are problems. The problems are that E. coli is a prokaryotic cell. It does not have endoplasmic reticulum, it does not have a Golgi. So formation of the disulfide bones and the proper folding of the secretory and membrane proteins, it cannot take place in the reductive environment of the cytoplasm of E. coli. So uh, how can then these uh, membrane and secretory proteins of higher eukaryotes be produced in E. coli? So there are several solutions and uh, uh, each of these solutions either singly or in combination have been used to successfully produce many uh, recombinant uh, eukaryotic proteins in E. coli. So first is that um, you know if uh, one is trying to produce this uh, secretory proteins or membrane proteins in E. coli then because they cannot fold properly they will start aggregating uh, and they will go into the inclusion bodies in this uh, in E. coli. So uh, in order to try and fold them uh, there or maybe even keep them in the unfolded state for some time uh, a co-expression sorry a co-expression of chaperones is uh, a strategy that is very successfully employed. And the second strategy is that if uh, the protein can be isolated from E. coli after production, then the folding can be uh, attempted to be carried out in vitro. And this is again uh, has been successfully employed and we will see uh, and this was particularly useful for um, production of uh, insulin in the earlier uh, time. And the third and the most successful strategy is to transport the recombinant protein to the periplasmic space of the E. coli. So you know the E. coli will have its uh, plasma membrane then uh, it also has another uh, uh, you know membrane or uh, cell wall and uh, the space between the outer and the inner membrane is known as the periplasmic space so this periplasmic space is because you know e coli will also have certain membrane proteins uh, you know certain porins etc so where will they fold they have to be folded and um, disulfide bonds have to be formed and all that happens in E. coli in the periplasmic space. So if the target uh, protein can be uh, somehow made to enter the periplasmic space of E. coli then it can uh, form disulfide bonds and it can probably fold also properly. So uh, many recombinant proteins, they are fused to a signal peptide or a leader peptide at the end terminus so that when E. coli makes them, 
it targets it to the periplasmic space and then they can be folded. So uh, this, uh, these strategies have been used for production of proteins in E. coli and um, for in case of insulin uh, because the efficient refolding uh, could be achieved uh, after isolation of the protein from the inclusion bodies it made it a very attractive strategy. So, uh, and for many other products, the secretion into the periplasm has been uh, used very successfully. For example, many antibody and antibody fragments are produced uh, from in the periplasmic space of the E. coli. So let's first see uh, the basic strategy that was used by Eli Lilai in uh, early 1980s for uh, producing insulin. So remember that at that time the RDT was not a very advanced uh, stage of development. The whole technology and the uh, kind of vectors that were available uh, was not very uh, advanced so but it was really a major major breakthrough uh, in terms of uh, demonstrating the efficacy and applicability of recombinant DNA technology for mass uh, production of therapeutic products. So what uh, the uh, scientists did in this uh, case, first they chemically synthesized the entire DNA sequence coding for the chain A and B of insulin molecule. And uh, at the 5 prime end, they added one extra codon for methionine. The significance will become clear later. And now the these DNA sequence for chain A and DNA sequence for chain B was separately cloned into PBR322 plasmid in frame with beta-gal gene. So it's they, they were made as fusion proteins with beta-galactosidase. And uh, then they were separately uh, put into E. coli and now E. coli will make these fusion proteins and uh, then these uh, fusion proteins were isolated separately and purified and the beta galactosidase was then removed by using cyanogen bromide. Now cyanogen bromide it uh, basically hydrolyzes a peptide bond at the C terminus of the methionine residue. So now you uh, see why because there was an extra codon for methionine at the 5 prime end of insulin so between uh, beta galactosidase and chain A or chain B, there is another methionine. So other than the start uh, of the protein. So the beta galactosidase will be removed and after the methionine that was added extra. And now you have the full length of the protein A uh, and chain A and chain B. Now this is where the ingenuity of the scientists came into play. So they used a chemical method, they used basic chemistry in order to form the disulfide bond within these chain A and chain B. So they joined them by sulfonating uh, these chains in presence of sodium disulfonate and sodium sulfide. And then they purified the active and properly folded uh, forms from because uh, uh, it is not necessary that all of the chain A and chain B will be properly uh, you know linked together and so they had to, after doing the chemical reaction they could purify the properly folded active form of insulin. So uh, nowadays a lot of work has subsequently taken place in terms of improving the insulin um, uh, that is made by recombinant DNA technology to make it stable, to make it uh, more active and uh, I mean properly uh, it should have the biological activity. So a lot of work has gone into uh, that but this was the basic strategy that was used first and uh, many current uh, technologies because companies use them for making the product uh, and they are uh, 
not in the public domain as to what are the details of how they are making these things. So uh, other uh, product that is of uh, importance is how to produce antibody fragments in E. coli. Again antibody uh, because they are big molecules, they are uh, constituted of multiple chains. Uh, uh, so uh, how to make them uh, in E. coli. So the very uh, simple strategy uh, which is used uh, for production of many antibodies or antibodies fragments is to clone them uh, in a plasmid vector. Uh, so you have the signal sequence followed by the variable and constant region of the heavy chain and again uh, the signal sequence and the variable and constant region of the light chain. So VH, CH is the heavy chain, variable and constant region. VL, CL are the variable and constant region of the light chain. So when you put this plasmid into E. coli, then you will have the uh, heavy chain variable and constant region produced as a single polypeptide along with the signal sequence and you have the light chain um, uh, heavy uh, constant and uh, variable region produced along with its own signal sequence. So because the signal sequence is present for both these polypeptides, they can be sent out into the periplasmic space of the bacteria where the disulfide bonds can be formed between the heavy and the light chains. And so one can break the E. coli cells by giving an osmotic shock and then purify these antibody fragments. So this is uh, one of the strategies for production of antibody fragments in E. coli. So uh, basically uh, a lot of uh, these uh, proteins can be produced in E. coli but of course many products are now made in mammalian cell cultures uh, which I will not be going into. We have learned the basics of that in earlier chapters but this was just to give you an idea about how these recombinant DNA products can be made in E. coli and similar strategies are used for many other products. So now let's talk very briefly about protein engineering and the reason we are talking about protein engineering is that the while uh, the recombinant DNA products can be made uh, if somehow the activity or stability or efficacy of these products can be improved upon then it is um, uh, very useful. So if, uh, so first let's see what is protein engineering. So if you can modify a protein sequence either by uh, substitution, insertion or deletion of certain nucleotides in the encoding gene, gene so that the properties of the protein are changed in a way which is more suitable for a particular application or purpose compared to the wild type native protein. So protein engineering uh, is a very um, useful technique but also a very tough technique because uh, you know nature has evolved these proteins over uh, so many years, uh, millions and billions of years. But uh, if you want to improve upon that, uh, then you have to be very, very good in order to do that. But it is very useful uh, uh, because then you can modify the protein to uh, make it very useful. So uh, for example, uh, the insulin, uh, I gave you an example that there is a C-peptide in insulin. Now that has to be removed. So that is again requires the deletion of uh, nucleotides in the encoding gene, you can do that. Similarly, factor VIII uh, also has a region which was uh, determined not to be required for uh, its function as a blood clotting agent. So one can delete that region uh, from the factor VIII gene and then introduce the cDNA into um, uh, an organism for production of factor VIII. So this protein engineering then requires the, uh, basically you are doing a mutagenesis of the gene 
and it is not a random mutagenesis. You are basically making a, a you know specific uh, site directed substitution insertions or deletions of nucleotides. So this is known as the site directed mutagenesis. So all protein engineering would require site directed mutagenesis of the gene. And there are many ways to do it, but a very basic uh, way I'm showing in this slide. Uh, so if you have a gene which is already cloned in a plasmid and you want to make, say for example, uh, a small change uh, in this uh, gene somewhere. So you can make a sense and an anti-sense mutagenic primer which will have the desired change already incorporated in the sequence of the primer. So for example, you want to change a particular codon to some other codon, then you can incorporate that altered codon into the primer. Now, uh, so then you use these uh, butagenic primers to carry out PCR reaction. Now, the for, uh, one primer will extend the entire plasmid in this uh, direction, the other one will do it in this direction. So, you will end up with these products which have a nick here, right? So, there will be a nick. Now, once the PCR is done, then you digest the PCR product with a restriction enzyme which is known as DPN1. Now what DPN1 does that it recognizes the methylated DNA and will leave the non-methylated DNA alone. So the DNA strand which is synthesized by the PCR reaction is not methylated because it is not coming from E. coli but the parental plasmid DNA is coming from E. coli and therefore it is going to be methylated or hemimethylated. So that parental E. coli DNA is then digested by DPN1. So the original sequence is gone and now you end up with the uh, DNA molecules which have this change that you had put in the primer, right? So now you take this product which now contains the mutation and you transform E. coli and what E. coli is going to do is it's going to seal these nicks here and make the entire covalently uh, close circular plasmid DNA and then this can be confirmed by sequencing that it has the desired change that you wanted to incorporate and then use. Uh, so this is the basic strategy. Uh, so you can use this strategy for uh, not only making uh, a few changes but also you can do insertions or deletion um, of sequences by using this, uh, this kind of a technique. So this site directed mutagenesis has been uh, very useful for uh, making the recombinant DNA products uh, through protein engineering to improve the efficacy or properties of those uh, recombinant proteins. And so now uh, we are at the stage where uh, recombinant proteins have been produced from many different uh, sources. So of course uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, and they have many different applications. So uh, proteins which are produced uh, for human use, for uh, and the animal products, there are plant products. Uh, there are uh, viruses and all, of course the bacteria is the workhorse of recombinant DNA technology. And you can see that there are, uh, of course this is, these are not the complete list, this is just to give you a few examples of the kind of proteins that are now made. So for example erythropoietin uh, is uh, required, it's uh, for uh, you know uh, blood production. Uh, alpha galactosidase and glucocerebrosidase these are the enzymes which are uh, used to treat people who have these lysosomal storage diseases uh, there is a tissue plasminogen activator interferons all these are used uh, are in the market uh, but, and these are produced by the common DNA technology and so there is a lot of medicinal applications of these uh, proteins and peptides. 
Similarly, for animals, uh, there are uh, certain uh, hormones uh, that are produ produced uh, for use uh, for animal husbandry uh, applications. So you have bovine somatotropin, porcine somatotropin, there is chymosine. And uh, many uh, enzymes are made uh, for research and industrial applications using plant sources. Uh, many viruses uh, are uh, used for making medicinal uh, products like the envelope protein of hepatitis B virus, the vaccine uh, proteins for HPV. So they utilize the virus sources. And of course, many enzymes are produced for industrial applications uh, using E. coli. So there is a whole lot of uh, products, uh, recombinant DNA products, that are made using a variety of sources that are either used uh, for um, uh, health applications or for research and industrial applications as well. Now, uh, moving on to uh, the genetically modified animals. Uh, of course, um, they, can, they are made. We all know as science students, we know about transgenic mice, uh, knockout mice, knock-in mice, and so on and so forth. So all those animals, of course, are used for research purposes, for carrying out a lot of basic research. But there are also a lot of other uses uh, and applications of these genetically modified or GM animals. So not only these animals, they can serve as models of human diseases so that the scientists can understand how various genes function, how the disease actually uh, develops and uh, also for testing the new therapeutics of these GM animals. Uh, so they serve a very uh, useful purpose for basic research and for testing out therapeutics. Uh, also, these GM animals are very useful for uh, what is known as xenotransplantation. So, for example, uh, you know, pigs uh, are um, used, um, uh, they have a very good use for making the organ transplants. But uh, to whenever you do an organ transplant, then the uh, transplanted tissue can be rejected because of the immune system of the host. So if these uh, animals, they are carrying a human gene, then the organ rejection can be prevented. So for such uh, pigs are being produced, which make humanoid, uh, you know, uh, organs so that the proteins uh, that are uh, present on these organs, uh, they are recognized as self by the human host. Uh, similarly, the, uh, the therapeutic proteins can be produced through milk of animals and many different types of animals, GM animals have been engineered so that they can make some uh, valuable proteins uh, in their milk. Uh, also, the, they can be used for production of hormones uh, by using the genetically engineered cells from the animals so that they can produce the hormones. So there are many different applications of these genetically modified animals and many of them have been uh, raised. Also for uh, some fun applications, I had shown this in my first uh, lecture that, uh, you know, some companies, they have produced these fluorescent zebrafish and uh, similar species uh, which can glow and they are marketed as glowfish uh, in the US. Um, you can buy them off Amazon. And so these are uh, sold as pets. And so it's very attractive to have these uh, glowing fish, you know, of various colors. And uh, one of the concerns with the recombinant DNA technology and uh, GM animals is the release of these uh, animals in the environment. And what are the risks for ecology and what are the ecological impact that these uh, animals can have? So for this glowfish, at least uh, it is uh, thought that uh, even if they are released into the environment accidentally, then uh, maybe there will be a minimal eco ecological impact because first of all, they will have a decreased survival capacity. 
because uh, they grow, they, they are more vulnerable to predation compared to wild type fish, which has all these camouflage uh, to prevent them be, becoming a prey. Uh, so, but these glowfish, they will just stand out and therefore they will have an increased vulnerability to predation and therefore uh, they may not really uh, have a very sustained and large impact on the uh, environment. Now, um, of course, uh, continuing uh, developments and advances in the recombinant DNA technology uh, is uh, improving the applications and, and the type of applications uh, of RDT in health. So, for example, uh, the identification of mutations, you know, which makes uh, people susceptible to certain diseases. Uh, and so, there is now uh, these techniques are used for. Uh, testing of gen genetic diseases and also for carrying out genome-wide association studies to uh, figure out the susceptibility of uh, to certain diseases and uh, so for example uh, breast cancer, retinoblastoma, uh, Huntington's, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, all these genes um, which are associated with, uh, strongly associated with certain mutations they can be easily identified. Also, gene therapy uh, finds its uses uh, for treatment of many different types of diseases, including cystic fibrosis, uh, many vascular diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, and also cancer. So gene therapy uh, utilizes recombinant DNA technology and uh, it is uh, very advanced now, very safe to use. And of course, the production of recombinant vaccines. And uh, many such vaccines are already in the market. Uh, many more are being developed and COVID-19 uh, nowadays is another one where all of you are aware the efforts that many countries are putting in to uh, produce a effective vaccine against COVID. So we'll talk about that uh, later. So, um, it is believed that uh, maybe more than $21 billion uh, market share will be uh, of the recombinant vaccines by the end of uh, 2026. And so some of the uh, vaccines, these are listed here. So for example, uh, the products, these are sold by various companies under different uh, generic names. So uh, Recombivax, Engerix, Helovac, Shamvac, these are all uh, basically um, prevent the uh, hepatitis B virus infection. And uh, this is a subunit vaccine, uh, more about that later. Then there is a Rotarix or Rotatech, which um, is used uh, to prevent gastroenteritis by rotavirus which is a live attenuated vaccine. Gardasil Cervarix, it is uh, used to vaccinate against cervical cancer and infection by uh, human papilloma virus. It's a new subunit vaccine and there are more. So you, you see there are many uh, vaccines, whether which are subunit vaccines and therefore they require recombinant DNA technology for their production and uh, they are out there in the market. Now, uh, because this topic is very uh, of great importance in the current time, so I thought that I will just uh, make you aware about uh, some of the basic uh, attempts that are going on across the world for developing an uh, effective vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so this I've taken from Nature uh, article uh, where uh, this uh, bar diagram shows the kind of uh, vaccines that people are trying to make against the SARS-CoV-2. And so they can, uh, there are attempts to make uh, either an inactivated viral vaccine or a weakened virus uh, viral vaccine, uh, then uh, using a viral vector in order to introduce uh, into the uh, into people to make a vaccines where either 
a replicating or a non-replicating viral uh, vector can be used as a vehicle for vaccine. Uh, DNA and RNA based vaccines are being tried and then the largest category is a subunit vaccine where a protein subunit can be used as a vaccine candidate and all the virus like particle can be used as a vaccine candidate and you can see the number of these different types of vaccines that are in development currently and of course there are many other efforts also um, so for example uh, people are trying to see whether uh, existing vaccines uh, against certain other viruses or bacteria can also uh, allow some development of immunity uh, which will protect the people uh, against SARS-CoV-2. Now very quickly uh, the viral vaccines as we know uh, they can be either weakened virus or inactivated virus. So weakened virus is produced by um, you know passaging it through animal or human cells many many times so that it picks up many mutations and may become you know less virulent so not able to cause a fulminant disease which can be used to uh, inject into people and this virus will be taken up by the antigen presenting cells and presented on their cell surface uh, in order to generate an immune response or the inactivated virus can be used. So this does not really require too much uh, any recombinant DNA technology. Uh, the other uh, approach is to use a viral vector uh, and this viral vector could be the kind that can replicate inside the host cell or one can use a non-replicating viral vector. So one has to introduce the gene of interest uh, from the coronavirus into these viruses. So one uses RDT to make such recombinant uh, viruses which can then be introduced into the human beings for uh, generating the immune response against them. So that is another approach that is being uh, tried. Uh, you can actually look and read this article. I have given it at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, there are also DNA and RNA based vaccines which are being tried. So you have this DNA sequence which contains the protein against which you think that an effective immune response can be raised. So for example, the spike uh, protein of coronavirus. So you introduce the gene for the spike protein uh, and uh, or you can have the RNA for that into encased into a lipid code which can then be transfected into the cells in order to uh, produce the viral protein which can be presented by the antigen presenting cell. And the largest category is the protein based vaccine where the either the spike protein itself or M protein or the epitope of the spike protein which binds to the receptor on the human cells can then be uh, used as a vaccine for um, uh, generation of immune uh, response. And also the empty shell without the uh, genetic uh, material of the virus can also be used, but this is a more difficult uh, uh, to manufacture these uh, viral codes for using as a vaccine. So these are the various ways in which the recombinant DNA technology is being, uh, you know, exploited right now as we speak for development of an effective vaccine against coronavirus. Now we'll switch gears and very briefly talk about uh, the various uses of RDT in agriculture. Um, as you know that, uh, you know, uh, in the old times also people have been doing, uh, you know, in breeding uh, of various crops to get uh, a particular uh, beneficial trait into the progeny crop. But uh, nowadays uh, this um, breeding of crops is uh, done on the basis of uh, what is known as the molecular markers. So these molecular markers are the DNA sequences which are linked to certain phenotypic trait loci in the uh, plants 
and uh, so when you many such markers have been developed for various crops and they uh, the technologies are basically uh, similar to PCR based technologies where you can uh, look for these molecular markers for various traits so one can locate these traits uh, related genes in various crops and then uh, once you know that what are the markers present in one crop and what are the various markers which are present in another crop uh, whether you know you can um, uh, breed them together to have certain other traits to be transferred so uh, it has been very useful for the breeding of many different uh, crops and also uh, because the gene mapping and cloning etc has helped in the production of uh, many different types of crops with more beneficial uh, phenotypic traits. Uh, also the RDT uh, is useful for the prevention and control of uh, diseases in the crops and the pest resistant crops so for example all of us are familiar with the pest resistant brinjal and cotton uh, in which the uh, bacillus thuringiensis uh, protein, crystal protein gene C cry one ac was introduced into uh, brinjal and cotton uh, and made, they were made transgenics uh, so that the host plant can synthesize this uh, protein which is basically toxic to uh, this insects, which are lepidopteran insects, so which cause the disease in this brinjal and cotton. So now you have the pest resistant uh, brinjal and cotton. Uh, of course, there are lots of concerns about uh, the use and uh, release of these uh, crops. Uh, but also RDT can be used to develop plants which are resistant to other abiotic stress. For example, um, uh, plants which are resistant to very low or very high temperatures, uh, resistant to high salinity, waterlogging, etc. So that will be a very useful thing uh, to have and make a lot of effort is being uh, uh, made in this direction across many different labs and many different um, companies in order to produce uh, resistant crops uh, and of course the quality improvement so for example um, sometimes uh, you know to tackle malnutrition uh, the protein content in for example rice eating people um, uh, they consume a lot of rice and they may not be getting a lot of protein uh, because of uh, you know many poor people uh, they cannot afford a lot of meat and protein rich food but if a, a rice plant can produce more protein then um, that will be very very beneficial similarly the many um, proteins uh, of plant origin they do not have all the essential amino acids but if they can be uh, made to produce proteins with all the essential amino acids then that will be very uh, nutritionally important um, so many different uh, quality improvement uh, can be made by using recombinant DNA technology so not only protein content amino acid composition the starch composition the polysaccharide compounds, uh, lipids in seeds and other storage organs, etc., can be uh, uh, introduced into crops to improve the quality of the food and also to increase the nutrition and also the sometimes storage properties. So, for example, the first commercially grown genetically engineered crop was actually tomato, and this tomato was called flavor saver and it was developed in early 1990s and uh, this was uh, developed to prevent the uh, you know softening of tomatoes because upon storage they become soft and then they are not very palatable so to increase the storage 
property of tomatoes uh, it was developed but uh, unfortunately this flavor saver uh, although it was called flavor saver it didn't have a very good flavor so this sort of uh, didn't take off very well but now we, uh, we know that um, at least in the United States um, almost 88% 80, 80 of the corn that is grown in uh, United States and 93% of soybean uh, is actually genetically modified. So you can see the extent to which the RDT technology has penetrated uh, the agriculture market. Now other than these very uh, obvious applications, of course RDT is also increasingly being explored for many other types of environmental applications. And bioremediation is just one of those uh, things. So for example, there are sometimes there are oil spills and if one can use recombinant uh, organisms to uh, quickly take care of that uh, oil spill in the oceans, then a lot of loss of marine uh, organisms can be prevented and the oceans can be cleaned. So for bioremediation purposes, uh, recombinant DNA technology is a very attractive uh, option that is being explored. Also for um, many industrial manufacturing processes, they uh, are generally very harmful to the environment and they pollute the environment. So if um, recombinant DNA uh, technology can be used to um, change certain industrial processes by using green chemistry or some other option so that the there is reduced pollution uh, that is also being explored on a very large scale across the world. Uh, also uh, for metal extraction and recovery from the mines uh, people are exploring uh, recombinant DNA technology uh, to introduce microbial extraction because there are many microbes which can extract these metals and uh, so if they can be made more efficient and faster uh, in terms of the extraction then it will reduce a lot of uh, you know uh, use of chemicals and other harsh methods which pollute the uh, uh, environment. And uh, also for uh, recovery, enhanced recovery of oil from the, you know, uh, crude uh, is also being explored uh, if it can be done with the help of recombinant DNA technology and genetically modified organisms. So uh, yes, uh, their uh, recombinant DNA technology is of course very, very beneficial, uh, but at the same time, there are lots of concerns, uh, both moral, ethical and environmental concerns in the use of recombinant DNA technology. And uh, the major concern about the use of uh, RDT and GM animals or GM crops is the uh, accidental release of these uh, organisms which are genetically modified into the environment. So that is the one major uh, concern that if you have made a recombinant bacteria for example or recombinant yeast if it is released into the environment what will be the long term ecological impact of that organism so that's the first concern uh, it is um, feared that these recombinant microorganisms they may find a niche for itself so they may make an ecological niche and uh, can proliferate in that niche and also they can be then transported by wind or water or um, you know other uh, methods they can be transported to other places and they can also uh, attack uh, find their new hosts including human beings so if that happens then what will be the impact on um, not only ecological impact but also the health of the humans and animals. Uh, then the there can be transfer of the genetic material, the recombinant uh, genes that you have introduced into these uh, organisms uh, can also uh, be transferred to other organisms. So for example we know that bacteria they uh, have horizontal gene transfer 
and they can exchange parts of their genetic material uh, between themselves. So if, uh, uh, supposing you have a microorganism that is producing a certain type of toxin, and that toxin gene is then uh, transferred between uh, various bacteria which are present in the soil, then it will be uh, really a devastating situation to encounter. So that is a very big concern. And so there will be not only environmental and other effects, uh, including the health of the animals and humans, uh, because there might be interactions of these recombinant organisms with the environmental or host factors. So what will be the long term effect uh, of these uh, recombinant uh, genetically modified organisms uh, is a major concern uh, and it is a very valid concern also because uh, long term studies uh, have to be done before we are absolutely sure about the safety uh, of these uh, animals and crops. And uh, so because there is this concern about the safety of these uh, recombinant uh, organisms, uh, there all countries uh, across the world uh, they have put into place uh, the systems, uh, the legislations and the monitoring agencies to extensively evaluate the potential hazards of recombinant organisms. You cannot just go and make any organism that you want. It has to be evaluated uh, and the safety concerns have to be addressed before the you can even start working towards making such uh, organisms. So uh, the various hazards they fall into three categories the infection hazard, the toxic hazard and the environmental hazard. So the infection hazard uh, basically evaluates that what is the potential of these uh, recombinant organism to cause a disease in either man, animal or plants uh, following the exposure. So if you're consuming uh, say a recombinant uh, corn, uh, can it really cause any kind of disease uh, in us or even for animal feeds if they are consuming some plants which are GM uh, plants uh, and also within the plants uh, can they cause some uh, infection hazard. So this is uh, one uh, category of evaluation. Then of course uh, the toxic hazard, whether the recombinant organism itself or any product that it is making, can it uh, make some, uh, can it be toxic either to uh, human beings or animals or plants or can it cause an allergic reaction or any other kind of biological effect uh, on animals, on humans, etc. So that is uh, also evaluated. And the third of course is the environmental hazard because there may be uh, toxic or other biological effects of the organism on the environment. So uh, all these have to be evaluated and uh, along with this um, there are very rigorous control measures which are put into place by countries and the scientific agencies uh, which ensure that uh, you know, all at the individual lab, uh, laboratory levels, there are certain good laboratory practices that have to be followed. And for industry, which is manufacturing these products, they have to adhere to good manufacturing practice, practices. And therefore, all these rigorous controls uh, by various countries and agencies, uh, it has enabled the biotechnology to be considered as a relatively safe industry. but. Uh, at the same time, there is definitely a lot of concern, a lot of debate uh, about in various countries about the use and uh, effect of recombinant products. So as a science students, we have to be aware of uh, these risks and concerns and we cannot just brush them aside uh, because uh, dialogue is important to carry these things forward in a proper way. So to summarize uh, what I've told you that uh, the recombinant technology has not only revolutionized basic research but has become a, a major economic driver because it has an impact on all walks of life. 
which includes health, it includes agriculture, environment, and many other industries uh, now use recombinant DNA technology. And uh, just in health sector alone, uh, the recombinant proteins, peptides, hormones, and vaccines, uh, they are routinely produced by RDT. And the first successful recombinant product uh, was the insulin in 1970s. And uh, the major challenge uh, for producing these recombinant animal proteins in E. coli is to fold them correctly uh, by forming the disulfide bonds if they require and the post-translational modifications, etc. And uh, these can be overcome by using many different strategies. Uh, prominent among those strategies are co-expression of chaperones, uh, targeting the recombinant protein to the periplasm in E. coli, where uh, the disulfide bonds can be formed and folding can be achieved, and or by folding the recombinant protein in vitro. Uh, now, other than E. coli, uh, yeast, insect and animal cell lines are now routinely used by biotechnology industry for production of animal proteins. And uh, RDT is also used for making uh, genetically modified animals. And these animals can express the desired proteins in their milk, for example. Uh, in agriculture, uh, RDT is used in marker-assisted breeding to improve the GM crops. Uh, many uh, GM crops which are resistant to either pests or uh, abiotic stress like heat, cold, salinity, water logging, etc. Or crops with improved nutritional value, taste or storage qualities have been developed. Uh, and GM crops like cotton, brinjal, soybean and corn, they have been introduced in several countries. countries um, sometimes to a very large scale and uh, also the um, concerns about the long-term effect on health and environment uh, have resulted in the formulation of very strict rules uh, for the assessment of risk and evaluation of the GM organisms whether they are uh, microorganisms whether they are GM animals whether they are GM crops and uh, they all are assessed very strictly according to lots of different rules and uh, this is to ensure the safety of the animals, humans and the environment. So that brings me to the end of this entire course um, and uh, for this particular uh, topic these are the three references that I think sums up uh, what all I have talked about in this uh, lecture. So you can note down these uh, references. These are available online, free of cost. So if you have the web access, you can download these articles and read them. So the first one will uh, give you uh, all the concerns and the strategies for production of recombinant proteins in E. coli, then uh, how these microbial cells can be used as factories for production of recombinant pharmaceuticals. This is a 2015 uh, update uh, and tells you what was the uh, latest uh, up to that time. And then finally, uh, given the raging COVID-19 uh, pandemic in the world, uh, I thought that uh, you might be interested in learning a little bit about how uh, various uh, attempts are being made to produce an uh, effective vaccine against coronavirus. So this is, uh, this sums up the various ways in which the vaccine efforts are going on for coronavirus. So this brings me to the end of uh, this course and I hope 
that you all have enjoyed. You learned something and uh, you are making use of the references that I have provided to you. All the best wishes to all of you. Goodbye.